here, because here's a, you saw that forestry is one of the major pressures. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the primary forest. This is not all pristine. Pristine's part of this, but this is largely unmodified. That's the total, global total, and then broken out for the three groups we keep looking at, OECD, BRICS, and rest of world. You can see declining primary forest through the period. But total forestry, when you start to add in production forest, does that. And those are the shares, particularly strong in the BRICS, but also in the OECD. It even starts to build again in rest of world um, from 2030 onwards. So uh, at a certain point, uh, there's a, the, the, the need for agricultural land in this model slows to a stop in a number of parts of the world, places like China, um, as a result of demography, the population starting to age. Uh, you also see in areas of the world where that's happening, abandoned land can be afforested. So you get changing land use, you do see um, um, uh, an increase in afforestation, but biodiversity, meanwhile, goes on down. Let's have a look at, um, and I've never tried to explain this in public before, so this is an experiment on you as an audience. This is a wildly complicated slide, but just to give you a sense of some of the goodies lying in the report. We played around with different scenarios. You, this is the thing that modelers love doing. Played around to see what happens, just, just to explain the interrelationships of policy. And we, we, we on the climate, we had a 450 parts uh, per million scenario. And that scenario is trying to reach 450 ppm and stabilise there from 2050 in a least cost way, okay? In a least cost way. And so on that basis, various things come into play. And one of them is quite a lot uh, of bioenergy, 20% of primary energy from, um, from uh, by, by 2050, which involves um, a 3.1 million uh, square kilometres of a bio cropland. That's three times the baseline business as usual case. Anyhow, this just gives you an idea when you, when you adjust for that trying to get to 450 parts per million and you throw in 20% um, uh, bio energy as well, this is the sort of um, outcome you get. Now, things which are below the horizontal axis, below zero, these are more negative in this scenario, and the things that are above are more positive. So the, the relative weightings are shifting, okay? So there you are. There is, um, there is food crops, uh, and there is um, infrastructure encroachment and fragmentation, and there is livestock. So in that baseline scenario, those are relatively larger drivers, um, and they're for pasture, and then... Uh, relatively less uh, um, uh, serious drivers. So there's less weight coming in from, so, uh, from I'm trying to interpret colours here, um, from uh, bioenergy. There's less bioenergy in this one. Uh, that's forestry. Uh, that one is former land use. And that one is climate change. The colours changed, un unfortunately. Sorry. Bioenergy is down below. That's right. That's what I said. But did I not? I'm sorry. I'm having troubles with the colours. Anyhow, what that's the net effect overall on that on that scenario. This is the baseline scenario. Uh, you get a tiny bit of 0.1 percentage point benefit for bio um, uh, diversity on the 450 uh, ppm scenario, where you've got quite a lot of bioenergy in there. Then. Just to, to sense, to, 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 as a sensitivity run, we said, okay, what happens when you reduce land use? And you reduce that land use so that uh, there is an improvement in the efficiency with, with which agriculture is occurring between uh, 3 and 18%, I think it is, of crops. Uh, the, the, the improvement in, in output. Okay, that'll have a claim on the environment as well, but it means that you don't need so much land. So you drop out about a million cubic kilometres for for cropping and a similar sort of amount for pasture, and that totally avoids the loss of forests and other natural ecosystems through expansion of natural areas. And so you can see you've still got those two negatives there, but what happens is that you've got a net effect for biodiversity which is significantly more positive. It's about 1.2 uh, percentage points. And what's happened, of course, is that you've had pressure taken off from pasture land, and pressure taken off from food crops. 
I think it gets a horrendously complicated slide, and I have probably, never having rehearsed this, made some slight problem here, and I've got PBL sitting here looking horrified. But still, it gives you the sense of what you can do, and modelers love showing they can do things with models, and this proves that they can do things and we can do things with our joint uh, models. But the point for policymakers here, and there's a box on page 292 of this report, or was it 192, it says, it says simply this, that that there are profound consequences for different policy mixes. So the way you go on climate will have consequences for biodiversity. Let's have consequences for water. Okay, let's have a look at water since I mentioned water. Uh, we're looking at a world currently that uses 3,500 uh, cubic, or demand is for 3,500 cubic kilometres of water. Uh, the bulk of it, historically, uh, has been used for for agriculture, for food production. There's irrigation, to which we can add domestic uses, a little bit for livestock, a uh, certain amount for manufacturing, and a certain amount for electricity. So that gets you to 3,500 cubic kilometres for, uh, for, for, of, of demand for water. And this is, in the, this is in our baseline. We project that that will rise, no policy changes, quadrupling the economy, that will take us to 5,500 cubic kilometres. And there are some humongous increases here. Um, a 400% increase uh, demand from manufacturing, a 140% increase demand from electricity, and a 130% for water for domestic purposes. And there is the breakouts. A um, bit, bit, bit of a decline in the OECD, big increases in the BRICS and the rest of the world. So that is a very significant uh, slide for me if we're talking to policymakers because we're saying, look, if, if, you, if you do not change the way you are using water, regarding it as free and limitless, these are the sorts of claims. And the result of this is that 40% of the world's population, another couple of billion people beyond today, 40% of the world's population in 2050 will be living in river basins under severe stress. So that is a very, very sobering thought. Now, you can see the biodiversity consequences. There's also big consequences for water here. If you think you're going to run uh, thermal power and, and use large amounts of water for cooling, well, where are you going to get it from in some regions? The competition between users is going to grow intense. Competition between industry, domestic supply, energy. So the water energy link becomes uh, stark. And you'll note there, if you were beady-eyed, that the irrigation fraction goes down in 2050. Now, it's a bit of a model-generated result, this, but we've checked this out, and it seems plausible that you can indeed make the efficiency gains... Um, and with some of the demographic changes, which, as I, as, as I say, is going to mean that, that agriculture will, will reduce its claim in some parts of the world, that is plausible to think of a world demanding much more to but using less for irrigation. But if we're wrong, if that is wrong, all you can say is that the competition for the resource will be that much more acute. So, again, it's a function of the model, but it's, it's food for thought. Let's move on quickly. Nitrogen, effluents from wastewater, big impact, obviously, for biodiversity. I don't need to tell this audience that. On the baseline, no policy change model, we're looking at a trebling, a trebling of the amount of nitrogen uh, entering uh, the environment. Uh, it goes from 6 to 18 million tonnes, um, and that's uh, obviously largely happening uh, in uh, non-OECD countries. And taking a look at eutrophication potential, and here we move into the marine space, we see this, 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 this series of maps I'm going to show you between 1970 and 2050 is of, of the eutrophication risk by river basin. These are river basins draining into the same large marine ecosystem. Obviously, red is bad and green is good. You know, <laughs> nice, simple, uh, stark uh, uh, differences there. And as I click through, that's 2,000 you can see an invasion of colour. And finally, 2050, you'll notice the, there are some uh, bright spots with inverted commas around them. The US slips back over acro across a threshold from, from orange to yellow. But broadly speaking, it's going, 
in the wrong uh, direction. Uh, and if I may say that.